today won't be smart tomorrow. That's one thing we know for certain. What the Romans built in 100 BC was considered smart with their aqueducts and their roads. Some of that road technology, by the way, we're still using in certain parts today. And that was a time when the developed world, as we know it, wasn't even developed, and in fact, it wasn't even a twinkle in the eye. However, what's different about today compared to the Romans or the Greeks or the Egyptians is that modern technology is available to all of us. And it's not geographically constrained. And we can implement it almost instantaneously. Now, that doesn't mean what New York is doing, we should be doing. We've got a very different set of priorities and a very different set of issues. We've got scarcer capital. We've got more limited skills in our market. And we've got different priorities and issues. And these will fundamentally affect the path that we follow in terms of smart technology. But that doesn't mean we can't make our smart our city smarter. And it doesn't mean we can't use technology to help make our scarce capital go further, upgrade our skills, and help solve some of the issues that we face every single day of the week. We've got to be realistic. Having the latest facial recognition camera might be important to some, but if a city has no power and no water, do they care? Does a person who's unemployed or struggling to put food on the table care about the environment as much as other people do? So what we need to do is use our technology to make our cities better for all of the people that live in our cities. And we need to remember that ultimately the city's population as businesses and as government or state-owned enterprises, these, the population is ultimately our client. And therefore we need to ask two questions. First of all, what do our clients want? And secondly, what are they willing to pay for? We aren't on the same path as cities such as Berlin, London or Singapore. We do have different needs. So we need to make the solutions relevant for our population. But this is where I get really, really excited. There is a fantastic opportunity here to use technologies to achieve a step change in terms of economic transformation and improve the quality of lives of all of our people. Especially given that over half the population of Africa is urban based and over 950 million more people over the next 25 years or so are expected to move into the major cities. So what I wanted to talk to you today about was the journey that we're going to go on and the steps we need to look at when considering what technology we use and the way that connectivity can make our, smart, our cities smarter and better than they are today. Now there are several reasons, several reasons I believe this. Firstly, Technologies are out there that allow us to use our scarce resources more efficiently. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's consider water. We all know that we have water issues in South Africa. And somebody was saying to me yesterday, we're likely to have load shedding but for water very shortly. We saw the issues that Cape Town faced in becoming one of the first major cities to run dry. There are water issues in various areas across, across our country. But did you know, for instance, that over 40% of all water is unaccounted for? 40% of all water is unaccounted for. It's called non-revenue water, and there are four main reasons to this. First of all, the obvious one, leaks. Secondly, it's not even billed for. Thirdly, it's built incorrectly. And fourthly, it's just simply stolen. But what's interesting is that we have technologies that can sell, help solve every single one of those aspects. We have leak technology. We can slow down the leaks. And we did that in the, for the Western Cape government. 
We helped solve the problem and helped push back the deadline for when they ran dry that ultimately got them through the, heat, uh, the hunt. The second reason I'm so excited is because we can use technology to get, to get ahead of the issues and save capital. Let me give you an example. The road network. We're all immensely frustrated with potholes and some of the roads have really deteriorated. But this is a classic case where prevention is better than cure. We're going to have to accept that much of our road network in South Africa is still struggling. And that potholes slow down traffic, introduce jams, when a, and when that happens, the velocity of a city slows down, we lose money, directly or indirectly. Did you know the current cost of fixing, and this is just the cost of trying to maintain the uh, roads and fixing potholes, is over 12 billion a year. And I think we have to accept that's probably not meeting the challenge. Did you also know that, and we've got problems on the rail, a truck on a road co causes 100,000 times more damage than a car? 100,000 times more damage. That means the problems are going to get worse. But I'm excited. Why am I excited? I'm just obviously a very excitable person. The reason I'm excited is because of today, there is already technology that combines AI, specialist camera imaging, 3D imaging, etc., that we have, within Nextdeck alone, that can go along the roads and detect cracks in the roads. Now, the reason that's really important is because a crack turns into a pothole. But mending a crack is a fraction of the cost of mending a pothole. Prevention is better than cure, and technology allows us to prevent the big problem that we're currently facing in potholes. Another reason I'm really excited is it can improve one of our biggest problems here, and actually one of the biggest problems on the continent, which is access to power. May was National Energy Month. I was expecting a slight giggle at that point, but it obviously didn't come. <laughs> It was actually Energy Month. And the aim of the month was to draw attention to the role energy plays in our lives. And I don't think any of us underestimate the role energy does play in our lives. But we've got to accept that the power crisis we're facing is holding the whole country back. And it's stopping making investments and it's stopping business. Technology isn't suddenly going to solve our problem and make our power stations brand new. But there are things that technology can help this country with that can make a material difference to our power problems. Obviously, there's a big move to renewable energy, and we know about that. Solar, wind, biogas, just to name but three. And those are part of the solution, there's no question about it. And technology in those areas is moving very quickly and accelerating, and it's exciting to see what's happening. But interestingly, it creates another problem. The problem it creates is the people that are converting to solar and renewable energy are the same people that are paying for power in the first place. So all we're seeing is ESCOM's revenue coming down. But the answer is we've all got to help solve the problem. We've all got to be more efficient. And I think from the previous presentation, you will see that building management systems and using our current uh, power needs more efficiently is part of it. We have IoT that allows us to monitor everything. We have building management systems that can switch power on at a touch of a fingertip. We can see exactly what's happening. We can turn generators on and off. We can turn lights on and off. And that's the most simple, uh, simple example. So we can use technology that is here today and being used across many and much of the world to make ourselves more efficient. And what's interesting is we can cut down our power usage for many of our businesses by up to 35%. That would almost solve our power problems overnight. The payback is there. You can get a payback as low as one to three years in certain circumstances. So financially, it makes sense. We also design the most efficient warehouses at Nextdeck. 
we need to be really efficient. So creating businesses that are efficient, because at the end of the day, we compete on a global scale. We're not an island. The next reason I'm excited is a problem that's quite personal to me, having been held up three times recently, is to improve the safety and security of our people and our population. And this is one of the most interesting areas where humans and technology collide. On mines at the moment, we're installing certain cameras that allow, uh, that through technology, allow you to work out whether people are wearing the right, right equipment in the in particular areas where they need to wear protective equipment. It's done all through technology, through no human uh, interface. The technology is allowing driverless systems, driverless vehicles. And much of that technology is now coming and helping us through the videos and through cameras and being applied in urban settings. But to make a change, we're going to have to change the dialogue. We're going to have to start thinking differently. It's not just about putting more policemen on the streets. If you're able to recognise criminals through facial technology or through number recognition, you can effect effectively and efficiently mobilise your police force. There needs to be a change in the dialogue and the way that we're using the human interaction and combine it with the technology. And the great thing about cameras is they don't eat and sleep. Smart security can save lots of money which can then be invested elsewhere. We have a scarce resource, it's capital. And this is where we've got to be forward thinking. In South Africa, we have effectively the same connectivity as the rest of the world. 5G, fibre, it's completely leveled the playing field. And one positive, as was mentioned earlier, that's come out of COVID, and that's COVID, not anyway, corona, anyway, it doesn't matter. I won't crack a joke again. Um, one positive that has come out of COVID is that we've embraced the non-office-based working environment. Yeah. And the world has embraced it. If this isn't an opportunity for us in South Africa, then I'm not sure what is. At EOH, we have developers that are based here and work for anybody anywhere in the world. Mm. Geography is becoming increasingly irrelevant in many, many areas. But what's actually interesting is we've got, we can utilize virtual reality goggles where you have the person, a trainer, sitting anywhere in the world, and it can be South Africa, training anybody on quite complex technology, or teaching them how to fix it. We, we as a country and as a continent need to embrace that. We also here, within NextDeck and the group of businesses we have, we train people all over the world on English. We train them in Latin America, in America, in Asia, and we based our businesses in the lower cost areas, and the, sorry, the poorer areas, and we're creating jobs there that are training everybody in the world. It's incredibly exciting. And it's a real job creation opportunity. But what it means is there is no reason why South Africa can't become the hub of the world when it comes to outsourcing. We have the technology, we have the connectivity. But more importantly than that, why aren't we using some of this technology to train our youth? It's there. But we need to make some brave decisions if that's going to happen. And we need to change the way that we think. The use of blockchain. Isn't the use of blockchain increasing opportunity for Africa? Isn't one of the reasons a lot of people don't make investment is because of the reputation we have in terms of such things as corruption. I'm reliably informed that blockchain is pretty tamper-proof. If we embrace that, surely we can change the, the perception the world has for us almost overnight and, and renew confidence from a global perspective and attract the capital we need to grow our economy. It's a big call. 
But just imagine if we embraced it. An example where technology uh, and is bringing new business and helping business here is Sansa. We were recently awarded with the South African National Space Agency a contract for the integrated business management system. They have completely embraced the technology. It's a great institution and uh, it operates the space regional weather system, it conducts cutting edge research, it's provided support to NASA's latest Mars um, mission. And what they've done with their facilities, they've integrated everything from perimeter control, CCTV, access control, alarming, building management solutions that will link all of their assets through IoT, their laboratories, their data centers. It's incredibly efficient, it's incredibly exciting. And all of this can be on a screen, it can be on your handheld device to an extent. But we're also seeing it in the public sector. We're working with the Western Cape government at the moment. They have over 2,800 facilities, schools, hospitals, and they reliably tell me that most municipalities have no idea of, where the, of their assets, where they are, what they are, what state they're in. And we're working with Western Cape government and, and uh, another uh, municipality on being able to create, um, to effectively digitize all of that. That allows them to monitor it, to manage it, efficiently and effectively. It allows them to allocate capital where it's most needed. Technology is there to help us run what we already have. It's help, there to help us on our journey to create smarter cities using some of the same infrastructure we, we already have. So by way of conclusion, technology is not going to solve all of our problems. We have to be realistic. We simply just don't have the budget as a country to be able to do everything we want to do. But we can focus on building better cities and we can enrich the lives of the people that live in it. I hope I've shown today that in today's world we can use technology to take the step on that journey to better cities. But, and my caution is, to do that, we have to have a mindset change. And we have to create a mindset that makes decisions to allow these changes. Thank you for your time.